whenever now, Tom, you know, we're kind of in June. I'm sure we're still, a couple of us are still making splits, preventing swarming. What's your, how do you make your splits? And along with that, how do you prevent swarming? Well, that's a, that's a lecture all by itself right there. Um, how do we make splits? We usually make our nukes with two and a half frames of brood average, two to three frames of brood. Um, most of the nukes that we're making in the spring, we're making them to sell. And we want them to be a good, fat, five-frame nuke to sell. And if you start a nuke with two and a half frames of bees and a frame of food and perhaps another frame with foundation and feed them, say, around a gallon of syrup, and after you start them in about three weeks, they're, they're premium and ready to sell. And that's why I choose that size. Now, this time of year, the nukes that we're making are meant just for queen mating nukes and perhaps something that just has to be big enough to get through winter, which is still a long ways away. Some of the nukes we've made recently have only got one frame of brood because, you know, they don't have to build up real quick. If, we're, if I was making a split or a nuke in spring and was, was going to try to make honey with it that same season, I might choose to make it with four or five frames of brood and a caged mated queen. We, uh, the, the nukes we sell in April, April is our nuke selling month. We actually purchased those queens from a friend of mine in North Florida because we can't make queens early enough to have good nukes ready to sell in April. And then after we're done making that round of nukes and we start making them for ourselves, we're using grafted cells because we are trying to introduce a certain type of stock that we like. And nothing wrong with the queens I buy. They're just a little different than the, than the genetics that we want to have in our outfit. So we really have two phases of nuke building. The early phase where we're buying queens in order to have them ready in three weeks. And then later when we're not in such a hurry and we're using our own queen cells. Let's see, what was the second part of that question? Is how do you prevent swarming? Along with that. Well, main, actually, our main swarming prevention is by splitting. Um, many bee, even beekeepers that have been at it a little while haven't quite picked up on the idea that if a colony peaks in population before the main honey flow starts, they're likely to make preparations to swarm. But if they peak in population after the main honey flow starts, in other words, they get into honey gathering more mode before they peak in population, uh, quite often they'll just forget about swarming and just get into collecting honey. You know, they're hoarders by nature. And once they start, they kind of get tunnel vision and forget about everything else. So we try to get our bees to peak after the honey flow starts. And I know, you know, initially you'd think, well, gosh, you know, if you're trying to make honey, why wouldn't you want them to be peak population before the honey flow starts? Hey, there's Greg. Greg's coming um, by. Anyway. Greg it's all right, I keep recognizing these names. Yeah, but, uh, you know, if you got to, let's just say you got 10 colonies and, you know, they all peak two or three weeks before the honey flow starts and you're really having a hard time keeping them from swarming and a third of them swarm and the others make a really good crop. And you compare that to somebody who's got 10 colonies that perhaps each colony made a little less because it didn't peak early, but he had almost no swarming. The fellow that split, <coughs> excuse me, and kept his bees from swarming, he'll probably have a bigger average. Mm 